There's a person by the name of Daniel Nash. I don't know if anybody knows of him. Anybody's ever heard of him. But Daniel Nash was a prayer warrior for a man by the name of Finney. Does anybody know Finney? And Daniel would go into a city three weeks or so before Finney would actually go into the town and he would uh, find somebody, a couple of people that he could, two or three, and they'd go and intercede uh, for, for the city. And uh, they would just get on their faces. In one particular place, when Finney came to town, uh, the woman met him at the door and she said, Sir, she said, I'm really, really worried about, uh, they called him Father Nash. I'm very, very worried about him. She said, him and two other people, they're down in the basement and I haven't seen them for three days. He said, but I opened up the door and had a little look in and they were on their faces groaning on the floor. And Finney said, don't worry. He said, that's just a spirit of prayer on them. This man when trouble would come, there would be groups of people there that would try to stir trouble uh, to make the whatever they were doing uh, impossible. And this man would get in there and pray. But not only that, he would also confront. And he went out, there was a bunch of about eight or nine boys that were really just determined to cause havoc in this meeting. And he went out to them and he looked at them straight in the eye eye to eye, and he said, boys, he said, I want to give you something, I want to give you a message. He said, I want you to know this, you will either give your lives to Jesus Christ or you will burn in hell. Finney said, in his journals he wrote, I was in my office and, and there was a knock on the door and the leader of this group came in and said, I am deeply troubled. And I'm tormented. He said, I don't know what to do. And then he said, you need to give your life to Christ. He said, I, I desire to do that. And he did. He gave his life to Jesus. He said, now, he said, what am I going to do? He said, go back and tell your friends what God has done for you. And then he said that most of those boys gave their life to Christ before that was finished. This young man, he, was, he, he died at about 56. So he's a young fellow. But when he died, within four months, Finney's ministry basically ceased. Because you see, without prayer, it won't work. And we are all part of something. And the church has forgotten how to pray. Prayer is not, Jesus, I need a new car. Or, Jesus, I would like for you to heal my arthritis. Prayer is fervent prayer, getting on your face before God and crying out for the nation of the world that men and women would be born again and delivered from hell. Amen? We can go to heaven with arthritis or with, a, with one eye even, but people will never go to, go to heaven without the Lord. I, I believe that we really need to do that. But within four months, actually what Finney did was he went and became a pastor of a church. I pray that people will come tonight to get a hold of God. Not to please the pastor or to please anybody, but to get a hold of God. That God can get a hold of our lives because we are living in, in, in uh, I believe, in a strange, strange time in the history of humanity. I believe that God is wanting to break through. Do you believe that today? So I'm going to, just going to share some things from my heart. I want to have a heart to heart. Amen? Don't expect God to do everything while we do nothing. Amen? I think I could just go home now. Don't expect God to do everything while we do nothing. The woman who had an issue of blood, many people were touching Jesus. And we're living in, in an hour when there are a lot of people going to church. 
touching Jesus in a way. And I was reminded while we were there that we may not have turned our church into a den of, a den of iniquity where there's all the goings on, selling doves and goodness knows what else now. That was Old Testament. We're a New Testament now. But I think we've made the church into a place of entertainment, into a place of pleasure. And I think that's got to change. I'd like you to hear it a little bit of if you... Because <laughs> otherwise I'm going home. <laughs> but the woman, woman that had an issue of blood... Yes, she had a need, but she had to push through a lot of things because she was determined to touch him. David had a mighty army. He had mighty men. Faith really is when you go, when you throw caution to the wind. It's something that the church has become so comfortable. And somehow or other we have all these great words and different things about great revival that God's going to do. Friend, I want to tell you, nothing's going to happen until we start to move and start to cry out to God. When the children of Israel were in bondage, and I don't know whether we realize it or not, but I believe that our world is in bondage. It's in bondage to the flesh. It's in bondage to our own desires and our own wants. People can get offended so easily and just walk out of church and, and you know, not, I'll never face church again or I'll never do this again. And, and it must be just the stench in God's nostrils. I, I believe that the church has got to come back. And another thing I believe is, is that Jesus wants his church back so he can be God. But real faith is when we throw caution to the wind. Faith is not just a little prayer. It's not just going here and there. It's, it's got to come something that, that is birthed in us. Something that, that God begins to stir. I was saying before, when the children of Israel were in bondage, it says that God heard the cries of his people. And I don't believe that they were just the, the, the cries of, of pain or anguish or whatever it might have been. I believe it was the cry of people that were, were saying, God, we, we just want you. We're sorry that we've drifted away from you. We're sorry that, we, that the stupid things that we did that caused us to, 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 to get in this situation. We're sorry that we, we forgot about you. But God, we want to come back and you know, we, we sing some songs there. I, I, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. Church, we've got to come back. People, we've got to come back to something that's more, more solid than just fluffing around playing church. Is it okay to talk like this? I'm coming back to a heart of worship. God is calling His people back. He wants them to come back into a place of, of surrender and prayer and worship and, and, and where it's all about Him. This world needs an outpouring of God's Spirit, which I believe is, is there. We know after about 300 years after the outpouring of the Spirit, when Constantine came in and, and there was a different rules and different regulations and, and it's like as if the Spirit, because he's a dove, and, and it's not that he leaves, it's just that he goes up a bit. He, he just moves away and he's waiting again. I believe the Holy Spirit is waiting again to come down. He's coming, he wants to come down again onto his church. He's wanting to come down into the hearts of men and women. And he heard the cries of his people. And that's what I, I, I want to see the church. And, and church, we may not ever be some great dynamic church where this is happening and thousands are being saved and thousands are being healed or whatever it might be. But I want to tell you this, and I'm saying this with every fiber of my being, if I can be a Nash, that'll do. 
if we can be a Nash church that can help usher in something and, and support something that God is doing throughout the world, I want to be there. Amen? That's what I want to do. I want to be whatever God wants us to be. It's not just a little prayer. <laughs> She's got a Honda and a Kawasaki. <laughs> Thank God be the glory. Yeah. There's one man in David's mighty army that he wasn't playing army. He wasn't playing warfare. It wasn't that he had all the epaulets and all the, all the glimmer and glamour and everything else. He fought so fiercely that his hand welded. The adrenaline was so strong. He fought so fiercely that his hand, he couldn't even take it off the sword. And friend, I want to say this, that we need to get a hold of the sword of the Spirit of God and we need to hang on to it so tight and we need to go out there and fight, amen, like that man fought. Because there's an enemy out there that's, that's ravishing our kids with, with cancers and ravishing our kids with, with pornography and ravishing our people with with. with with the, the rubbish of this world and, and our kids are sh shoving heroin up their veins or whatever they, however they do it. I don't know what they do. But we're seeing a world that's being lost. And the church just sits passively by wanting its next cappuccino. How many people believe something's got to change? Come on, do you believe that? Come on, start a change in me, Lord. Start a change in me. His hand clamped with his sword. We need to clamp our hand around the sword of the Spirit and stand our ground against the enemy's attack. Only through God's help could David's mighty men win battles against the enemy. I spoke last week. One man, the odds were 300 to 1. He fought him off. 1 Chronicles 11 verse 12, there's a guy by the name of Eleazar. Here he is standing in the, with the rest of the army in the middle of a, of a big field of grain. But the Philistines came down against them. And when the most of the army saw the Philistines and their, all their rubbish that they were going on with, I don't know how they would have been making the noise, the great hode that was coming against them, they ran for their lives. But the, David has a, David, the Bible has a record that David and Eleazar, as Eleazar stood their ground in the middle of the field. They defended it. And struck the Philistines. They knocked, they took them down. And the Lord, it says, brought about a great victory. Friend, we can't just say, God, you do it. This was a combination of human effort and divine effort. And I believe that this next revival that's going to come, and it will come, friend. There's going to come a revival because God said it was going to come, but I want to tell you, I believe that the Holy Spirit will go around and stir the hearts of men and women and we'll hear the trumpet sound and we'll begin to stand and we'll stand our ground, amen, and we'll begin to rise up and we'll take hold of the sword of the Spirit and there'll be something on the inside of us that's greater than any suggestion that anybody could ever, ever put into your mind because we put deep inside of you that will cause us to rise up and say to the enemy, we will not move. David and Eleazar, they stood their ground, they defeated their enemy, they brought him down. But it is a combination of human strength and divine effort. I'm always a great believer that you have to give God something to work with. You can have the greatest chef in our midst and if there's nothing for him to cook, 
there's nothing for you to eat. He can have all the potential. He can have every bit of knowledge. He can know everything. He can have the oven preheated, uh, heated to the right temperature. He can have the sharpest knives. But if he doesn't have a lamb roast waiting for him to cook, you go without. You've got to give God something to work with. You can't sit at home or play tiddlywinks and expect that everything's going to work out fine. The devil will ravage you. He will walk all over you. We've got to do what God tells us to do. One of the things that struck me is the armies of Israel, the armies of God, as they ran, ran in fear. They never realized the potential that was in them. You won't realize the potential that is in your life until you go out and start to demonstrate and start to speak to people. Yes, yes, it may be uncomfortable, but when you start to speak to somebody and the anointing comes down and the presence of God comes down and while you're speaking to that person, you start to see tears rolling down their cheek and you lead them to Christ. Or you go over and you lay hands on a sick person and they get dramatically healed. You, 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 you won't know until you have a go. And these people, these, this great army ran and not understanding the potential that was on the inside of them. Church, I want to tell you that we do not understand the potential that God has invested into every one of us when you got born again and when you got filled with the Holy Ghost. He didn't fill you with the Holy Ghost so you could just speak in tongues or have a prophecy every now and then. He filled you with the Holy Ghost because He said, you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you and you're going to be a witness unto me. And you're going to go and do great things. And these signs will follow them that believe in my name. They will. Hallelujah. That's what the church is about. Not cappuccino church. I love cappuccino. Actually flat white with the coffee on the side. (laughs) But can you imagine David and Ali Azar after the battle, can you imagine their conversation? There's a bunch of people that have just fled. They're looking at each other, shaking their legs, and, and, and they're, they're, I don't know how far away from the battle they are, and they're over there, man, man, I hope they don't come, I hope they don't come. But here's David and Eleazar, and here they are in the midst of the battle. It's hot. They've just had, can you imagine their conversation? I was trying to put myself in their position. I can see David look at the other bloke and say, mate, he said, man, that was a good fight. <laughs> oh, God is fighting for us. God is fighting for us. Hallelujah. Oh, man, Eliezer, I just saw there, there was this giant of a man that he had a sword in his hand and he was about to take your head off and you didn't even have a clue. But somehow or other, you just put your spear at the back there and you got him. <laughs> Oh, and all these things, man, they killed a whole battalion of people. The the things that they would have seen, that battle, man, I would rather go home and start talking to somebody about having a go for Jesus, amen, and talking about the great things. I can remember in 93 when we had the outpouring of the Spirit of God, and even then we were over in America talking to to, uh, David, uh, no, um, Piano parts, Andrew Ironside, and we, we just started to talk about the things of God and, and, and all the things that we'd start to see. And as we we're talking about, the Spirit of God just came in. I don't tell you, if we were starting to talk about cappuccinos and other things, God doesn't turn up. We have good fellowship, but if you want the power of God, start talking about the things of God. Start taking a few notes about what God's saying at this hour. Start stirring yourself up, amen. Start getting on your face, amen. Cry out to God, do something for goodness sake. What a great, what a great thing on the way back to the camp. You see, they didn't look at the enemy, what the enemy wanted them to see, all their huff and puff. They kept their eyes on the Lord and His promise. 
the battle is not yours, it's mine. When you've done all to stand, you've got to stand. Hallelujah. That's how you get the job done. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding, but in every way acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. You believe that today? I believe that God wants us to do the same. The Bible is full of, of, of these sorts of accounts. There's a man there, one of the great prophets of old. He was there, and the, the, the king had sent 50 men up to gather him, to get him back. And he just looked at God, he said, if I've found favor in your sight, if I've been, you know, whatever it was. You can't do that if you've just been bluffing around. This man obviously had, had waited on God and went after God, and, and God was around his life. And he said, if I've found favor in your sight, Cause fire to come down. <laughs> Smith's chips. Three times. And then God said, go with them. I bet you I was a fourth guy. I'll tell you what, he had a lot of faith. <laughs> David kills a lion and a bear. Samson killed a thousand with the jawbone of an ass. It's all supernatural stuff. Jesus comes on the scene, starts doing amazing things. He feeds 4,000 people with seven loaves and a few small fish. He had seven large baskets left over. You know, Jesus invented the doggy bag. That's your must I remember that. Jesus did amazing things. He turned water into wine. In Mark 1.39, he cast out demons. Mark 1.43-42, he healed a leper. I won't go through all the scriptures because they're all in Mark. He, read the whole book. <laughs> he healed a paralytic. He healed a man with a withered hand. He del delivered a man with a legions of demons. He, he healed a woman who had been sick for 12 years. He walked on water. Jesus feeds then 5,000 men with five loaves, two fish, 12 baskets left over. Jesus heals a deaf mute. Now he feeds 4,000 with seven loaves and a couple of fish. And the church leaders come to him. The church leaders come to him and they say, Give me a sign. Show us a sign from heaven that we might believe in you. Jesus' response was he, he, he sighed deep in his spirit. I believe. Can you imagine? He's done all this stuff. Don't tell me that these people didn't hear what he was doing. They would have heard of all the things that he was doing. And the church leaders come up and say, show us a sign that we may believe. Show us a sign from heaven. And Jesus sighs deep within, him, within his spirit. I wonder this morning what God, what Jesus is doing when he looks over his church and he sees what's going on. He sighs deep in his spirit. I, I honestly believe that the spirit of slap would have come all over him. How stupid can you still be and still breathe? Jesus' re re response was Matthew 12, 39. And he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seek after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jonah was three days and three nights in the fish's belly. So will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That is a very, very interesting scripture. 
very, very interesting scripture. Jesus really is a sign, amen, to us. No sign shall be given to it except the sign of Jonah. And he speaks about himself as a sign. That he's going to go in to the bowels of the earth for three days and for three nights. And what's going to happen? He's going to rise again. Amen. That is the sign. I don't think that the disciples had a clue what Jesus was talking about. I don't... <laughs> I, I, I really don't know what it would be like to be one of the disciples. We all think, oh, it would be wonderful to be one of the disciples. But I don't think so. Because Jesus spoke in a language, in a mystery, that was so contrary to natural thinking. And then whenever he did start speaking that language, they would rebuke him. They'd say, no, no, you don't, no, 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 we... He had to say to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Get, out, get away. I've got to do what I've got to do. And friend, it is so important that you and I have an ear to really hear what the Spirit's saying, not popular opinion, not what the prophets from overseas are saying, not from this one saying, not from somebody else is saying, Though there, it's all great. But I want to tell you, friends, what you find if you listen to everybody, you get so confused. I want to tell you, get your ear open to what the Spirit of God is saying because when it's the Spirit of God, whatever He's saying, He's going to say the same thing. He's certainly not going to say the rapture is pre, post, mid. <laughs> Just to confuse us all. I know what he says. He says it's pan. It's all going to pan out in the end. <laughs> the only part of my Christian walk I don't have to worry about is how I'm going to get to heaven. Somebody said, what, what do you? I said, I don't know. And I don't care. If it's before, if it's in the middle, if it's after, well, praise God. I really don't care. I don't care. Somebody said to me one day, do you believe that we go to sleep when we die or we go to heaven? I said, I don't care. I shocked her terribly. I said, lady, I don't care. And here are the disciples. They're, they're watching. <laughs> they're, they're watching Jesus' response. A wicked and adulterous generation seek after something. Oh, no. Oh, and no sign shall be given to it. Bunch of drop kicks. I've just fed 5,000 people. I've just fed 4,000. I've healed all these people, and you're asking for a sign. Trust and obey for there's no... Friend, just believe. Only believe. Hallelujah. Only believe. All things are possible. The disciples are there and, 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 and Jesus is speaking to them and, 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 and they get in the boat. They go to the other side. Peter says to John, there's the bread. They've got no bread. They forgot the bread. They're in trouble. He's not happy. All those guys that ask for a sign. We've got no bread. He's going to ask for something to eat. We've got no bread. And then Jesus walked up to him and says, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. My God, that really picked it up. You notice the leavened bread. <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And then he said to him, because he's God. He said, what are you? What are you? Here's these great men of faith and power in the molly grubs because they forgot the bread. Going down the gurgler, like most Christians do. We all pull the chain on each other, don't we? <laughs> I, can, I can see Thomas would have said, not my fault. <laughs> I got the boat. <laughs> and so, he said, why are you so fearful? What, how come you've got no faith? Don't you remember? Friend, we've got to start remembering some stuff. We've got Ken and Pat here. Oh, God. The, ga the old gatehouse, eh? Rhonda, the gatehouse. Up in the up in the pineapple shed. Still, others here. I, I, I'm not going to mention them more because I'll get mixed into trouble. How come you so? Got no faith. Got nothing to do with bread. And all of a sudden they had a revelation. We've got to start remembering. He said, Don't you remember? I fed the 7,000. And how many large, how many large baskets? <laughs> I, would, I think he would have emphasized the large. Doggy bag, keep it going. Can't you remember the five thousand? Can't you remember that 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 man that was demon possessed had a legion of demons? I, I would not be surprised if the loaf that they had might have been a bit out of the doggy bag. Could have just said Jesus. We forgot the bread, but here, <laughs> do your thing. Do your thing. So I'm not even interested in bread. I'm not interested in bread. Can I say this, church? Jesus necessarily isn't interested in most of the things that we concern ourselves with. But there's one thing that I believe that he's interested in is the souls of men and women. Is the souls of men and women. And we've got to get back to winning souls for Christ. Souls. And then they remembered. It really had nothing to do with bread. But it had everything to do it's the souls, I believe. It's wrong thinking, wrong doctrine, wrong thinking, wrong concepts. And I believe that today, and I'm pleased, I believe that we've got to come out. I'm coming back. I'm coming out. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Amen. I can hardly wait to get to that meeting tonight again and fall on my face before.